Hi, uh, afternoon everyone. Um, sorry for the delay. I was slightly technologically challenged. Uh, my hardware is a bit old for the um, projector system here. Um, so um, this might have come across as a slightly odd, uh, oddly titled talk. Um, uh, so to give you a bit of background, um, I'm the jester in the court. Uh, my favorite a uh, comedian is, um, one of my favorite comedians is John Oliver, who's a, a very popular and controversial um, commentator on US and other world politics. And uh, if you can sort of see my talk in that light, uh, uh, it might be uh, hopefully mildly enjoyable. Um, anyway, so, um, uh, from the title, uh, obviously there's a few uh, complex uh, words in there. Um, I'm, I'm sort of assuming that most people here uh, have been following cryptocurrency uh, and or the blockchain uh, and have some context about the background from which um, the blockchain and cryptocurrency arose. Um, there's a lot of body of work that preceded uh, what we today know as the blockchain. Um, so I want to kind of touch upon a few points here and there. And if it doesn't make sense uh, hope, uh, in the beginning, hopefully it will eventually. Um, so let's start with anarchy. This is arguably the picture that comes into most people's minds when we think about the word anarchy. Um, you know, some sort of violence and loss of control in government and, you know, uh, this is the public image of uh, anarchy. This is a uh, terrifying thought for most of the general public. And I've used a word there that you can read yourself, um, slightly derogatory. But in general, um, this is the public understanding uh, of the effects of anarchy. Um, and um, Bitcoin came out of uh, a sort of um, software developer's uh, anarchic world. It came from... Um, you know, a world of software uh, anarchists. Um, this is what governments see. It's terrifying. Anarchy is terrifying for governments. It's the individual that wants to challenge authority and do their own thing. Uh, very terrifying. This is what corporations see. Now, interesting, I couldn't find uh, a public domain picture uh, anywhere online, so you'll have to go and do the uh, Googling or duck duck going yourselves to find the image. But basically, uh, if you can imagine uh, Nicolas Cage uh, in his role as y Yuri or Orlov, uh, you know, if there's an archie, then I can sell a lot of weapons, you know, make a lot of money out of it. Um, this is what corporations see. Uh, and obviously, um, if you've heard about the paperclip maximizer, that's what a corporation is supposed to do. It's supposed to maximize profits for its shareholders. If it isn't doing that, then it's not doing its job properly. Uh, it's an AI. Um, so, um, moving on, this is what anarchists see themselves as, actually. It's not threatening at all. Um, I got this public domain picture from online. This is a completely random picture. I don't know the person involved. But essentially, they, you know, they put across the idea um, the most accurately, uh, as far as I could tell. And the basic fundamental idea uh, behind anarchy is uh, sovereignty over your own uh, mind, your own consciousness. Uh, there's no implication for other people uh, or for other systems or for the world. Um, and essentially a crypto-anarchist comes from this perspective. Um, I want to be able to control the way I um, do commerce with other people, trade with other people, uh, and crypt, crypt, you know, cryptography is... Um, the means by which I can, you know, that I, I know software, this is what I do, and so this is the tool with which I'm going to um, implement this idea. What is crypto? Well, I'm sure you've uh, all watched the famous uh, um, uh, technology-based movie. Uh, um, I won't name which one it is, but this is the idea of some really complex stuff, just yeah, like scrolling down your screen. It's all cryptic. <laughs> Um, this is the idea of a um, something really complicated, really, in, in uh, everyday parlance. 
Um, this is what a computer scientist would see cryptography as. I um, don't know if uh, many of you have heard of um, the uh, computer science idea of complexity um, and the big O notation. Um, but essentially, um, cryptography is, to put it in really oversimplified terms, um, it is to weaponize uh, 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 computational complexity um, in a way that um, is advantageous to the programmer so, uh, or to the person who does the algorithm. And, and the best way to illustrate this is the uh, one-way hashing function. So it's easy to calculate the result going in one direction and you get an answer, which is essentially a hash. Uh, but it's really difficult to go the other way. So if you're given A and you take, you, you run it through a one-way hashing function and you get B, or is it X and Z? I don't know. Anyway, um, and then, and that's easy and it happens very quickly. Uh, and the algorithm makes sure that uh, calculating B from A happens in, in uh, order one uh, complexity. But going the other way around is extremely difficult. So you'll have to really crunch it through brute force uh, and, the, and, and the function is designed mathematically to make sure that this happens. Uh, and so this is what I mean by weaponizing um, complexity. Um, and so people figured out how to put together these algorithms and then arrange them in interesting ways. Um, and so if you follow the blockchain terminology, you'll hear things like the Merkle tree and the Bloom filter and stuff like that. Um, and essentially, uh, these are um, putting together these basic ideas of crypto uh, into more interesting data structures where you could, for example, search through uh, large parts, uh, large volumes of data with a specific question in mind, uh, which is, is this key that I'm searching for part of the set that I'm looking for or not? Uh, and a bloom filter, for example, would definitively tell you no, but maybe yes. So there are a few um, mathematical ideas, but what I'm throwing out here is basically trying to kind of give some context about the word crypto. All right, currency, controversial again, but we'll have to step out of the um, world of software and um, move into the world of uh, political economy. Um, in the 80s, when um, hash cash and um, e-gold and all these things were going on, um, we, the world had gone through a period where uh, global economics had basically disappointed people with any sense of what money is. Um, if you look at the 30s, um, the, the phenomenal sort of uh, big event that happened in economics was that Franklin uh, Roosevelt basically banned private ownership of gold. You'd have to have a license in America, to in the, in the United States of America, to um, own gold uh, privately. Um, and what this meant was by the 40s, uh, the United States uh, government was basically the largest gold owner in the entire world. Um, and people who had been used to trading with gold understood uh, what this meant. With gold, you could trade with anybody you like. People instinctively understood uh, what gold was as a value exchange. So you give me 10 cows and I give you so much gold. Uh, you know, and there are these um, biblical stories and so on, uh, historical stories of people carrying around you know, metal coins. Uh, you know, and this is where coinage came from. Uh, and now this was gone. It was illegal to hold gold. Uh, and there were justifiable reasons. Um, as a politician in a democratic country, obviously, uh, FDR could not write his personal writ. It was obviously you know, based on a series of economic events that happened. But in, you know, de facto, this is what happened. Um, and post-World War, you've got a situation where the only exchangeable commodity uh, with the three properties that real money should hold uh, were embodied in gold and the US held control uh, of more than 50% of that commodity. Uh, and so they basically um, helped uh, come, come, uh, come across with this global currency exchange system called uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement where 
uh, people actually agreed to uh, the US dollar being uh, the global uh, sort of currency of exchange. Um, but, you know, people are not fools. They, they wouldn't come, they wouldn't agree to this uh, either without sufficient amounts of coercion or sufficient amounts of, uh, of um, greed. And obviously, uh, the fact that the US government had 50% of the gold was, a, you know, a large part uh, of why this was, you know, this was uh, to be pulled off. Uh, and come 1971, um, uh, Richard Nixon basically said, so, so the Bretton Woods Agreement was basically um, a situation where any country could go to the US government and say, oh, look, I've got $100 million. I want gold worth $100 million. And the agreement said that the US government would have to actually give them physical gold in exchange for the $100 million. And in 71, Nixon said, sorry, we're not going to give you any more gold. You can you know, get lost. We're just going to say that a dollar is a dollar, and that's it. It's whatever we decide it is. Uh, and this is, uh, this is um, basically known as the Nixon shock. So what's the situation now globally? Um, basically, governments print paper money, uh, and uh, they play games with it. And this is the situation in which cryptocurrency was born. Um, if you look at the original email by um, the person allegedly known as uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, he talks about... Let's go there. He talks about, um, sorry, I sort of have to uh, switch slides here. But um, he talks about, so, so this is from his original uh, paper, uh, the Bitcoin paper. And he says, commerce on the internet has, be has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as tr uh, trusted third parties to process electronic payments. So it's coming from a very anarchist uh, perspective. It's coming from this perspective that um, we don't have control over, uh, you know, what we use as currency. Um, and so, oops. Uh, and so what, what the tech community, the sort of crypto anarchist tech community did was they said, okay, well, we're going to put all this stuff together. We're going to put software and crypto and the internet together uh, and use our weaponized big O and uh, the innovative thing uh, that today we know of as the public blockchain um, to create this trusted third party. And what does the trusted third party algorithm look like? If you want to understand how the blockchain really works as a trust mechanism, you have to go back to Lamport, <coughs> Leslie Lamport, who is a pioneer in uh, distributed systems. Um, and this is a paper from 1986 uh, called The Byzantine General's Problem, um, where the problem of consensus, uh, now when we talk about consensus, we mean, um, you know, if you have multiple people who do not trust each other completely, uh, or at all rather, um, what does it take for them to collectively be able to agree on something? Um, and basically it boiled down to the problem that is illustrated in this uh, diagram, which is the problem of that of one person in a three-person situation giving an order to two people to agree to attack or not, basically, in, in the Byzantine um, general's problem. And it turns out that in order for uh, the group of three to actually agree uh, completely in consensus, you need to have um, at least 2n plus 1, so at least two-thirds uh, of the people trying to do consensus need to agree that, you, you know, agree on whatever that is that they're agreeing on. Uh, and so this idea basically means that, um, for example, on the, on the, on the blockchain, um, if you have less than a third, sorry, more than a third uh, of people deciding that they don't want to talk the gossip protocol and they want to do their own thing, the blockchain is in trouble. Um, and why do I say that? Well, um, I just pulled this off the um, Bitcoin blockchain.info pools um, website. This is the distribution of uh, mining pools for blockchain in the world. Um, and if you, if you look at this distribution, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of labels um, 
uh, distributed around. And then there's like this very, uh, you know, well, very visible highlight in red that says a large portion of unknown blocks does not mean an attack on the network. It simply means that we have been unable to determine the origin. Um, so why is it that if you look at the unknown percentage, it's 9%. It's not even 30%. It's not, you know, you need to have at least 33 or 34% for our argument's sake uh, of, uh, you know, of the participants of the blockchain network to mount an attack. But why is it that, uh, you know, this is very visibly, um, you know, put on the, on, 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 the web, uh, on the web page, right? So it says, um, you know, we're unable to determine the origin, and, and it seems to be something that needs to be clarified. Um, well, the reason for that is that there is an unwritten consensus, uh, which is the consensus of a trust network, which is human. It's completely outside of the algorithm. Uh, you know, you know the mining pools, you know... Uh, you know, who the people involved are, uh, or at least you have some sense of what they stand for and what they're, you know, what's in it for them. And the unknown is terrifying. The unknown is terrifying in the same way that the unknown is terrifying for a government. Uh, I hope you can see the parallels here. Um, so, you know, this brings us to the, uh, what I call the, tro the Trojan horse narrative, uh, which is, uh, and, and going back to Nakamoto's original quote, um, where he, he recognizes this, obviously, uh, he invented the thing, so he recognizes it. He says, the system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of ha uh, attacker nodes, right? So, so we're in a situation where, you know, everybody knows that as long as, so this is not about individuals, this is not about miners who are individuals, this is about miners who are computers and as long as the cooperating group that agrees on on the consensus um, controls the largest amount of CPU power then everything's all right uh, and the uh, blockchain algorithm for Bitcoin specifically in this case will be safe uh, but really is that the is, is, is that the narrative uh, uh, you know th th this is a I mean, anybody with common sense knows that, the, you know, the, this is a given, um, and it's mathematically proven by Lamport. Um, I would contend that the real Trojan horse is an idea which spans across more things than just cryptocurrency. I would contend that the real Trojan horse is this idea of techno-utopianism. If you look it up, you'll find some really interesting things. Um, there's a brilliant, um, there's a brilliant um, documentary by Adam Curtis, and it's called Hypernormalization, um, in which he talks about um, this narrative where essentially um, these entities, more or less in, in, in a broad uh, grouping, um, are sort of enforcing a fake narrative, what's today known as fake news, I mean, it's very popular now, but actually um, there, is a, there is a strong uh, discourse which, uh, which disconnects the public from the reality of, of life. Um, so if you, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I've been to different countries with very drastic political sy uh, systems. I've, you know, I've, I've lived and taught in North Korea, for example. And then when I step out of North Korea into the real world, my mind is boggled by the amount of propaganda actually that's hitting me when I you know, step into the Western world and vice versa. So, you know, it's, you know when you when you're fish in water, you don't really um, uh, realize that you, you, know, you are in water. Um, but when, you know, so what I'm trying to say is that, the, the, you know, there is this um, situation uh, where that's okay. It's normal. Uh, uh, and... This idea of techno-utopianism uh, is, I, w I have a hypothesis that this idea of techno-utopianism is now uh, sort of getting into the world uh, of economics and sort of driving the narratives that the blockchain is useful for everything. The blockchain, uh, you know, is that hammer for which every problem is a nail. Thank you.
I have a little plug. This is a um, $10 device called the Adafruit. It's an NFC reader. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to um, demonstrate it, but um, it reads NFC cards. And if you've used Visa PayWave, uh, I read my card today. It's really interesting to see what information comes out of it. And I actually went around and stuck uh, some of these with a um, Raspberry Pi under your chairs. So, no, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, if you want to have a go and read your card, um, I'm happy to, you know, display to you what your NFC readable card uh, you know, holds information about. It's very interesting. Uh, I did not invent this. A uh, friend in a friend of mine put it together, Tavish, uh, and we're going to actually showcase this at Hill Hacks in Hack Beach, which is my, uh, you know, the organized whatever, the communities that I represent at Foz Asia. Uh, we're going to uh, have a go at this properly. Uh, that'll be in May, so you're more than welcome to come. That's my plug. Hill Hacks. Oh, this is an Adafruit. A D A F R U I T. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, the, the, the narrative that the blockchain is um, independent, so that the technology can create the neutrality required uh, in commerce is a false, is a, is a false narrative. Okay. So, sorry. sorry. They're saying it's a false narrative, or they're saying that it can do this, therefore they're promoting blockchain. Uh, I'm saying neither. I'm saying that um, the uh, the whole you know the whole idea behind the blockchain is that you're applying technology to a social, to a human problem, uh, and so you you so for example the the newer narratives of having AI drive um, you know the um, the trust <laughs> issues in in blockchain networks, for example, is again sort of um, giving up human control in that uh, system and allowing the, the technology to look after issues like trust, for example. So, 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 I mean, so I'm, I'm more a technical libertarian, right? Um, I kind of have an impression that you might be as well. Uh, but I, I see that um, you know, it's an issue of where your consensus comes from and what you're placing trust in. And, and the question is, can technology mechanism where actually the only thing you need to trust is the code and the algorithm. If the answer is yes, then smart contracts and such, they, they, uh, I prefer the word crypto ledger than blockchain, because blockchain is a solution for what a crypto ledger provides, it's not the actual thing. But if a, if a crypto ledger can actually execute contracts in a, in a provably correct manner, it replaces 80% of what the nation state does for us. And it does so using a voluntary mechanism rather than a mechanism that's based on support, which all governments are. So uh, I get the impression that governments should be afraid of this rather than, rather than exposing an error and supporting it. Excuse me, how is it that it does it continue to be a voluntary mechanism for when that comes to commerce? It becomes this course of. Okay. You're, you're assuming that the major application of crypto ledger is commerce, and I'm telling you that's a minor application. No, no, I, I, any form of intercourse. How does it become voluntary when it, when it is the only way to do it? It becomes this chorus of information state. You're just replacing one thing with another. Voluntary. Nobody's pointing a gun to your head and saying you have to use Bitcoin or this. You can use whatever. You can, you can create your own. And you can branch at any point in time. It's completely open. In theory, except that you need except that you need to have the resources, which are expensive. Well, that's, that's assuming that you're going off a of proof of work, which is proof of waste, which is absolutely not. Anything that's going to last us more than a couple more years, you know, that's going away. Even, even Ethereum is getting off of that. Well, yeah, I mean, so that, you know, that boils down to, again, trust networks. So, so you have this narrative that was built upon the uh, sort of, you know, you can have the absolutely perfect, anonymous, uh, you know, uh, individualistic existence, which is the crypto anarchist dream. Uh, and then you have this sort of, uh, th there's sort of this, um, th this uh, the reality is that it's slipping in, which is that trust networks are actually creeping in. And the people that are participating and calling the shots in those trust networks are not necessarily uh, the end users who are promised this crypto and stream. You're saying it's being compromised. Exactly. I don't disagree with you. I'm speaking at 11 o'clock tomorrow, and I'll be talking about it.
All right, brilliant. I look forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. I think I've run out of time. Oh, there's one more. Yeah. Um, uh, about the, the currency slot. Um, there's one bit I think that, that, that's missing in the general narrative. I think that uh, most people who are interested in the topic should read the book Debt, the first 5,000 years by David Draper. Brilliant. It's available on archive.org. Yes, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I'll try and pop that in there in a, uh, in a later presentation if I do this later on. Thank you for that. Thanks.